I had been living in New York a year and a half when I got the call. I knew something was wrong when Mary, who runs the outreach program on Haight Street, where I used to work in the late 90s, left a message saying, call me. It was Pete, she said. Pete, the anarchist raver, six feet two, whose long blonde dreadlocks and two ponytails should have looked silly, but worked on him somehow. Pete, who wore bright orange vests and went to Burning Man, who DJed the anarchist cafe every year and played house music that no one would dance to but him and me. <laughs> Pete, who loved chocolate chip cookies as much as I did and would bring cookies to our meetings at a cafe in the Tenderloin where we ran the Dope Project, teaching drug users to save each other's lives from overdose. Pete, whom I'd last seen at the harm reduction conference in Oakland, imploring him to join me in taking over the world, ignoring how terrible he looked. Pete had OD'd in the bathroom at a friend's house in Berkeley. He passed out against the door. He was so heavy they had to call the fire department to remove the door's hinges to get him out. When Pete died, it was January and in the 30s in New York, yet all I could think about was wanting to jump into the ocean to defibrillate my heart into accepting the news. I rode my bike down Flatbush to Coney Island where old Russian men in Speedos pace back and forth thumping their chests. I stripped down to my boxers and walked into the freezing water, the cold stinging my skin and clutching my lungs. It helped, but it wasn't enough. I remember thinking, I don't know what to do. I had moved to New York for the same reasons as anyone, for the art, the culture, the ambition, PS1, basketball on West 4th Street, bagels on the square the home to American Jews, the place my mother was born. I came chasing memories of rifling through jazz records on St. Mark's Place and staring up at posters of queer bodies on visits as a teenager, but living there was a shock. 14-hour work days, women in high-heeled shoes traipsing through snow in fur-lined coats, Everyone, everyone wearing designer clothes. A man, this is a true story, a man on Wall Street, where I worked on Wall Street, not for Wall Street, but I worked on Wall Street, literally grabbed me by the shoulders and shoved me aside because I wasn't walking fast enough. I'd moved to escape the bubble of San Francisco to meet people who didn't agree with me on everything, to learn and grow. And it worked. When I was in New York, I did things I never would have done here, like buy a pinstriped Calvin Klein suit and learn the meaning of business casual. The nonprofit, nonprofit where I worked, took us to see a Broadway show every year at Christmas. And um, I got to wander the streets of the Lower East Side. I got to watch the Muppets take Manhattan under the Brooklyn Bridge. I got to see my first nephew being born. And yet, even though when I was there, I met other artists and queers, I never felt quite at ease. Um, I felt like I would need to live there for another five years, if not 50 years, to truly feel at home. And my sister said about living in New York, your calendar will fill up, but you won't be part of a community. I debated whether to go back to San Francisco when my friend Gretchen from San Francisco, but living in New York, gave me a tarot reading to help me decide the <laughs> I know, I had to write, so. Um, the card that I pulled was a man curled up in a ball, surrounded by swords, all pointing at him. I was paralyzed with indecision, but I felt like I had to prove that I could tough it out. So when I flew back to San Francisco for Pete's memorial, it was like seeing a sky full of stars for the first time. The service was held at a chapel in the Castro, 
Um, it was, you know, all of my friends were there, Pete's family was there, and it was just like overflowing with weirdos dressed in bright orange um, in honor of Pete. Uh, at the service, I found out that Pete had been a choir boy when he was little, um, which explained his fondness for the irreverent hymn sung at his memorial. God is a lesbian, she is a lesbian, God is a dyke. <laughs> the service turned into a parade down into the mission with Extra Action Marching Band leading the crowd on 16th Street with their trumpets and drums. My best friend and I held the banner of Pete's name that I had sewn on the plane, orange strings of silk streaming behind us while the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence sprinkled orange glitter over the crowd. It was emotive, earnest, celebratory, everything I hadn't realized I was missing so much in New York. The memorial back in New York where Pete had once lived was overcast by comparison. It was held in a basement uh, up on 126th Street, uh, the basement of a church, and you know, no one said much, and then they went out to drink and there was arguing, there were some stories, but there was no glitter and no marching band. And I knew then what I needed to do. I, I knew that I needed to come back to San Francisco. I needed to ride the 14 mission and have someone ask me, hey, didn't you go to Everett? To recognize me after 25 years. I needed to run into awkward Dyke March hookups at Rainbow. <laughs> <laughs> whose uh, buckets of wet tofu I used to reach into when it was on 15th and Mission. <laughs> I needed to ride the 22 Fillmore where I last saw Bob Smith, my friend Noah's father, before he died of AIDS in 1991. He was holding an oxygen tank and he was clutching his brown leather briefcase um, and he opened it up to show me its contents and he had a Walkman and two CDs by the other Robert Smith, uh, lead singer of The Cure. <laughs> and he was heading to the beach, he said, and he, he just struck me as someone who was doing exactly what he wanted with the time he had left. I needed to be connected to this place and its history, even if I wasn't squatting its abandoned buildings as a homeless teenager or an anti-war protester anymore. I needed to feel affirmed in my crunchy, punk, queer, vegan identity. <laughs> And I needed to be somewhere where, where all of me could be seen and where people really talked about astrology. <laughs> 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 I needed the layers of heartbreak and joy that imbue every corner of this city with memory. I needed to come home, even if it was to a home I didn't recognize, to see what was still here. Do. I somehow thought coming back to the city would bring Pete back, but of course it, he d it didn't. Nearly 10 years later, I have his picture on my altar, and his picture is over there right now. Um, so what does it mean that I'm still here, but he's still gone? What does it mean to still be here when I now live in Oakland, which itself is rapidly changing, and the places I remember are gone? The Noe Valley Community Store on 29th and Sanchez, the real foods on 24th Street where I was with my mother during the 89 earthquake, bottled juices shattering all around. Epicenter on Valencia Street where I used to buy any seven inch that had a girl's name on the, on the label. I didn't even know what the band was. It didn't really matter. <laughs> um, the street names are the same but the places have changed as have I. So what does it mean to still be here when the gravitational pull loosens? When the friends I knew growing up in San Francisco, I, I only see on Facebook the very medium that's dissolving our connections in real life. What does it mean when my friends get up, get fed up with the higher cost of housing and move away? I'm not one of those people who moved here to reinvent myself. I didn't leave behind a box of trophies and yearbooks in my parents' basement. I don't have a cheaper hometown to move to when I find a partner and want to have kids. This is it. When I first got back to San Francisco from New York, I couldn't walk down the street without thinking about white hegemony. The irony of a city priding itself on its radical politics while getting whiter each year, as black and brown people get pushed out to the margins in places like Pittsburgh, Antioch, Brentwood. 
I was so alarmed with the changes every time I emerged from 24th Street BART that I find, found myself hiding up in Bernal, haunting the Alamany Farmer's Market and watching the L Word on TV at the Wild Side West. <laughs> When I had to move to Oakland to be closer to my job, I avoided the city altogether, coming back only to get Inca in, bunk, in bulk at Rainbow and see my old friends. But preparing for this show, I find myself paying vigilant attention to the places that remain and choosing to spend time in them again, wanting to still be here in the present, not just in the past. In Glen Canyon, where I used to get high with my friends in high school at McAteer, where I used to play where I remember playing flag football in the rain in seventh grade, sweet child of mine blasting on the boob backs, feeling for the first time since my family moved here from Hawaii when I was 10, like I fit in amongst the punks and goss and metalheads. In Yerba Buena Gardens, where I take my nephews when they visit from New York, walking through the Martin Luther King Memorial, I catch my breath under the thundering waterfall, remembering a time before it was there at all. Went across the street at the seven-story squad on third and mission. We lay on our backs and watched his technicolor images of the traffic below drifted across the ceiling like satellites. A nick in the black paint having created, uh, sorry, a nick in the, in the black paint covering the windows, having made a pinhole movie camera whose projection only we could see. In La Boheme Cafe on 24th and Mission, where Nicaraguan poets still play chess and drink wine, where every time I walk in, I cross my fingers, the owner will say, a long time no see, and not, there's a $5 minimum for Wi-Fi. <laughs> where I meet a friend visiting town after moving to LA. I order tea, and we share a vegan chocolate chip cookie and talk about the strangeness of his new life. As we stand up to leave, he offers me the last bite of the cookie. I take it and think of Pete. Thank you. <laughs> 